Hello, my name is Eddie Adams, and I'm going to show you every step I took to make this filter. So let's jump in and get started. So first of all, I usually set up the LUTs right away just to get that out of the way. It's pretty much the same in every project, so I kind of I know how to do it right away, and you know I already have a lot of the LUTs built out and the little uh, patch asset there is always nice just to drop in. And one tricky thing about using LUTs is that if you use a LUT and a face smoothing or a retouching object, that interrupts the LUT because the retouching doesn't get the LUT applied. So you have to do this kind of tricky workaround where you apply the LUT color correction to the face texture and then pipe that directly into the face material and then apply that to a face mesh. Otherwise the face will look discolored compared to the rest of the background. Here I'm organizing my scene right away. I know I'm going to be doing 10 different artists in this, and so I built all these nulls to put every asset per artist in there. And because I have a plan for each artist, some of them have makeup, some have a hair object, so I'm just going through and building all these kind of default assets I know I'll be needing. Mostly face meshes. I think there might be a particle system in there somewhere. Basically just starting high level, blocking things in first, and then I'll dive down and get more detailed. I also know I'm going to be using instructions on this, which are the on-screen prompts so users know what to do. And they're, they're really nice because you don't make them yourself, you know, the Spark AR team does, and so they automatically get translated no matter what language the user is using. That's why it's important to use instructions and not build your own, like, ping that you put in there. Now I'm setting up some of the logic for the, the switcher. The goal is when the user presses record, that will trigger the randomization that will run for a while and then eventually it will stop and it will land on some of the or one of the artists at random and thankfully since this is such a, a viral concept there's plenty of YouTube tutorials that explain the base logic but because I'm not using an image sequence I'm using nulls each containing different objects the results of the randomization control which null object is visible and to do that I'm you know going through this node structure and then in the end I'm making an equals where if the result equals three then that toggles a boolean which is true and then that unhides that specific null And because I wanted a different LUT for every different artist, or a handful of different LUTs, I had to build this in kind of separately than the null structure, because I didn't want to have a different background kind of video texture for each artist, because I think that would be maybe a little less efficient on the CPU. So instead, each result of the randomization is piped over, and then the LUTs get assigned kind of based on that. Like that switcher there it takes the input in and then it chooses the LUT based on the result. And I know this is going kind of fast, but if you pause it you can look a little bit more closely at each different node and understand the flow a little bit better. And there's probably ways to do this a little bit more efficiently where you use some sort of loop or a different kind of logic that you don't have to duplicate everything out as much, but because there's only 10 different nulls in there, it's not too much trouble just to build all of those out manually.
So now I'm already getting started working on the first artist, Post Malone. And he was an easy one to figure out what to do with. He has very iconic tattoos on his face. And, you know, spark air filters are very much face-oriented, so <laughs> this one was, was an easy one. And thankfully, there's tattoo packs online that you can actually purchase based on his face tattoos. And so I was able to grab that, pull out the individual designs, and then place them on the face texture. And this background face texture is one of the included face assets that you can get through the Spark help menu. If you go to the top of Spark, I think it's one of the, the last menu options. You can go to, like, I think it's help, and then download face assets. And it comes with a masculine and feminine face texture, 3D face meshes, and a 3D head occluder. And you'll see this coming up a little bit later, but you'll notice right now all of the tattoos are very digital. Like the the edges are very sharp. There's no bleed, as in like the ink isn't kind of softening into the skin. And so when I finish this round of this part of the filter, you'll notice it looks too sharp, too digital. So eventually... I'll go in and take a smudge brush and manually soften the edges and smudge it up to make it look more natural. So now back in Spark, I'm taking that tattoo texture and if you pause it, I know it's going a little fast, but you can see it looks fine, but it's very sharp. And like I said, we'll get to that in a little bit. So now I'm on to Ariana Grande. I had already made a few makeup textures in the past for other filters, and so I was able to use that as a base to get started. And the Spark AR template that has the makeup example includes an RGB mask for the kind of eyeliner, lips, and eyeshadow. So you can use that as a jumping off point to kind of isolate different parts of the face. Like these, the shape of this lip shape is taken directly from that. Here I'm just softening, in a, softening some of the, the shapes of the highlights and contours. One thing I found tricky with Spark is that the face texture, you can have a shape, especially at the corner of the eyes, that looks pretty straight, or maybe there's a slight curve, but then when it's applied to the face texture, the eyebrow kind of protrudes and you, you get extra curvature along, like right where I'm dealing with right now, that little curve at the tip, like that will get very exaggerated, so it's a little bit of back and forth to find the happy medium where that shape isn't too twisted. And a lot of this makeup stuff is very experimental, meaning that you can, you know, draw the shape in Photoshop, bring it into Spark, and then it might not look nearly what you thought it would because the edges might be too sharp or the intensity is either too dark or too light. Now I'm manually painting on the eyelashes onto the makeup. There is the option to build 3D eyelashes and have those mapped to your eyeballs, but I found most solutions that use that, the the lashes don't map quite right, or the rigging's not quite right, or there's a little bit of glitchiness, so I decided just to stick with the texture instead because you still get that you know eye pop from the makeup, but you don't have to deal with rigging additional elements for each of the faces. Maybe people have figured out good solutions for the eyelashes, but 
In this case, I think it looks fine just painting it on. It's kind of funny, you learn a lot about makeup blending and makeup theory as a guy <laughs> doing this and just trying to figure out what the heck's going on. So here I'm using the face paint material, which is really nice because it can take the background, like the video, and kind of multiply that from behind on top of the kind of makeup. And, and so it's not just this flat texture, but it kind of reacts to the lighting and shadows behind it. And here, like I was talking about, if you look at my eye on the right there in the background, you can see that edge kind of cuts down a little bit. So I'm trying to reverse that and push it up a little bit more to counteract how much it droops in the, the face mesh. I think in the end I just left it. I think that's just kind of how it's going to be when you're doing that kind of makeup. And sure, I could have kept tweaking it, but I just wanted to move on. Now I'm starting to build out her hair. She has a very iconic, I guess, high ponytail, you might call it. And so the obvious route would be to make a little cylinder, put that shape out, and then, you know, build the rest of the hair waterfall from there. There's a lot of different ways I could have done that. I could have used a spline with a sweep or, you know, box model that, I mean, that's essentially what's going on here. Because the shape was simple enough, I could pretty much just manually push those polygons where they needed to be and eventually add a little bit of bumpiness so it's not a perfect tube, but there's a little bit of variation. Like here, I'm kind of pushing that top edge up and down, get a little bit more detail. And the material will add most of the actual hair details, so we we can keep this one nice and low poly. And now here I'm in Ryzen UV, which is an amazing UV unwrapping program. Cinema 4D's UV tools are very bad, and, and so getting out of Cinema and bringing the, the mesh into here is a really nice option. And the plugin has or this program has a plugin in Cinema 4D where you can click one button and it'll open the UV unwrapping program, import the mesh, and then you do all your work here. And then as soon as you hit Control S to save, it closes that program, brings the new object back into Cinema with the UVs, and then you can just keep going from there. It's a really amazing program. So now I'm in Substance Painter. This is another amazing program for texture painting. It's it's part of the substance kind of group. There's substance designer, which is more of a kind of seamless material creation program versus this one, substance painter, is more about manually painting textures. And there, there are smart materials you can use as well, but the beauty of this program comes from all the painting tools they have in it. And because this is nicely unwrapped, all those shapes are very easy to draw along. They're, I intentionally made each axis perfectly straight, so if I paint right along one of those shapes, it goes directly down the hair object. And because I'm not relying on any lights in the scene, really, all of the shading is being manually painted on, so the, the bottom inside of the hair shape is darker. Just like if you look at the picture of her on, on the right here, next to her neck, it's very dark, but on the top of her head, there's a lot of highlights and the light's able to hit it more. Now here I'm starting to rig up the hair. <clears throat> I think I don't actually need that many joints, but the idea is when you tilt your head, the joints will rotate opposite your head direction. So if you tilt your head to the left, the joints will rotate to the right, so they're pointing downwards at all times. Or Maybe I got that mixed up, but basically it, it reacts to your left and right head rotation.
And one thing to keep in mind or, or just to know about is that in Cinema 4D, when you export a rigged object for Spark, the FBX and I think it's DAE files, for some reason, the rigging doesn't work like at all from, from my testing. So I installed this, this plugin for Cinema that lets you export the GLTF format, which is this kind of newer format I guess made specifically, or or maybe it's just ended up being used for kind of real time online applications. Like I think Sketchfab uses this format because it's very efficient, and the rigging seems to export and import really well using it. So now I'm just getting all the layers set up. I'm I'm using a body segmentation to just put the entire hair shape behind me because I knew you'd never see it in front of any part of your body and so I didn't I didn't need to use a head occluder but I'm just using segmentation so it's just always behind you so now I'm starting to build in the logic for the head rotation so you'll see I'm piping in from the face tracker I'm unpacking that and reversing the Z value, smoothing that out, and then packing that back into the Z value of a joint. And that way, like I was saying, when you rotate your head, that joint will rotate. And so it's always pointing downwards, more or less. And I was noticing that the end of the hair object, I I wasn't anticipating you would see the, the edge, the bottom edge of the hair, but you definitely do if you tilt your head enough or if you'd stand up and walk a little bit further from the camera it, it shows and so I needed to just manually brush out some of the opacity at the tips of the hair and this isn't going to be seen that often so it doesn't have to be super accurate it's just just a little bit of softening to break that up I think I noticed here that the very edge of the hair wasn't transparent, so I'm just painting a little bit more and making sure that edge goes all the way to transparent so you don't see the edge of that image. And I think I'm calling that good. And to stay organized, each main chunk of node logic I'm putting into a little comment bubble. I probably could have used groups to keep it even cleaner, but Sometimes it's nice just being able to see everything all at once and not having to dive in and out of, of groups. And maybe there's efficiencies doing it one way or another, but eh, what can you do? <laughs> now for Billie Eilish, this is the first iteration. I end up coming back to this later and kind of cleaning it up, but I'm just playing around with different brushes trying to get that kind of dark wet look it's it's not quite water paint but it's not quite you know a solid brush so I found this this nice brush it's kind of water painty the edges are a little wet looking so it's a little more natural than just your standard soft brush so at first I just sketched out the rough areas where the reference image shows all the the black paint and then I go back and kind of add detail, fill in all the gaps, and smudge it up a little bit too. And this is a really fun process. I'm just starting to get the hang of using a Wacom in Photoshop and really using the Photoshop brushes to their maximum potential because I've never really dived too deep into all the different you know wet brushes versus dry br brushes versus smudging properly and so it's been really fun learning that more and getting into it so now that I have this texture in the scene I'm using a physically ba based texture that way it can reflect an environment and I have this this nice kind of abstract environment from Grayscale Gorilla that I purchased from their Pro Studios metal kit. 
and it's nice because there's there's no color information and it's just black and white and so it gives you reflection detail but it doesn't affect the color cast of any of the objects and all the environment maps I believe have to be HDR files or yeah I'm pretty sure it's the HDR format so those files are pretty heavy so I had to scale the resolution of that environment texture down to I'm gonna probably like 1k by 500 pixels And now I think looks like I'm on to Drake now. So my idea with Drake is, you know, his his style. I I didn't find a lot of kind of iconic things. He has a very distinct face, and he uses his face a lot in his album art and his just general presence. But there is a Drake meme of him from I think Hotline Bling, where he's looking away from the camera and putting his hand out. So I wanted to take that idea and put the user's face right in there. So this process was kind of laborious because you can't just put someone's face in front of his face because obviously it's not going to line up or you'll see a little bit bleeding through and I could have taken the face texture that's extracted in Spark and like mapped it to this but I thought it'd be more fun if your actual 3D face was in the photo and you could move around and it would react. So the first step in doing that is breaking out his hand like I'm doing here and then completely painting out his face and head just to leave an empty hole where his, his head was. That way when you put in the 3D face, it fits in and you don't have to worry about you know, covering up his face or doing anything weird inside of Spark. And the reason I'm breaking the hand and arm out is, is because I wanted the face to be behind the hand. So when you move around, you know, obviously your face wouldn't be in front of your hand. And so I had to break that out. And one idea I had was that the hand would actually be even more three-dimensional and like coming out from the photo. So when you move around, you would see some parallax, but ended up not doing that because, I don't know, maybe I just forgot. <laughs> and sometimes, once you get to a certain stage, when you're, when you're making a filter, doing 10 different things inside the filter, you just got to keep it a little simpler. Not that I'd followed that advice <laughs> at all, but... Oh, man. So now you can see I've kind of cloned some stuff behind him using the clone stamp tool. I've painted and smudged it around. So now his, his head pops out there pretty good. But I also, you know, with my idea of the hand being able to move, I wanted to paint enough of the back behind the hand out so that if there was movement, it would look fine. Like you can kind of see there, I'm moving the hand around, around seeing what it would look like. And so often you, you do a lot of work on something with one thing in mind, and then as you develop the filter or 3D project or whatever, your, your plans change, and so sometimes you spend a lot of time working on one thing, and then it turns into another. See, there you can see I was kind of waving the hand around. So here I'm 
anchoring the, the image to my face. So when you move around, the image is tied to you rather than locking your face to the image, I'm locking the image to your face. And that ended up being pretty fun because as you move around, you're kind of a little bit more embedded more naturally in that space. <laughs> it just looks funny. And so the trick with layering this up is that in the objects, you can see it says use depth test and that's turned off. So it doesn't matter where in 3D space these objects are, it just reads down the hierarchy and then from there, it draws each layer based on the hierarchy from top to bottom. And that's one thing to keep in mind where objects in the scene hierarchy render and calculate top to bottom, but on the layer tab, your layers are more like Photoshop layers where the top layer is rendered on top. So it's kind of opposite. And that's confusing, but it makes sense because layers you can imagine you layer on top of things but in the scene hierarchy, you start you know, at the base and then move all the way down through the hierarchy. So now moving on to Travis Scott, he has an iconic, or I don't, know, I don't know if it's iconic, but he has a pretty distinct album cover where there's a giant golden inflatable head of his head with his braided, you know, dreadlock style hairs that I'm trying to mimic here with the LUT that's a very golden, you know, bright LUT. And then in the album art, his mouth is open in this inflatable head and people are walking into it as smoke is billowing out. So here I'm building the smoke part of that. And with, with particles and spark, there's, there is a way to fade particles out over time using scripting, but I am not a programmer and I, I'm not really a, I don't, you know, I don't really know, JavaScript or whatever they're using. And so instead, one, one nice thing to do with particles if you're doing a, a smoky effect is you turn the opacity way down and you turn the birth rate fairly high so things will, or the, the particles will appear, but because they're so low in opacity, it feels like very smooth as if they're, as if they're fading in and fading out. And initially, I was just going to try to find a good cloudy fog texture, but I couldn't really find anything that was exactly what I wanted. And so I just hopped into Photoshop and painted this little fluffy cloud. Another thing to keep in mind in Spark is, you know, you only have four megabytes at most for Instagram. And ideally, you keep it down to like two megabytes to, to reach more people. And so when making a texture like this for a particle, if the particle is not very large and the opacity is really far down, you don't need a, you know, 1024 by 1024 image. You could do, you know, easily 256 square and it'd still have enough fidelity to work. And there's that album right I was talking about. It's pretty ridiculous, honestly. So my first plan was just to find a nice braided texture and slap that on, you know, a cylinder with some, you know, displacement. But I could not find a good even texture for that. Even like this image here, I don't know, just it wasn't high res enough or the shape wasn't quite right. So I figured I should just paint something and that way it would match on top of the shape just right. And whenever you make any 3D models for Spark, it's always good to import these default face assets because that way the scale of everything is going to be correct and you can already anticipate exactly the position things will appear in Spark. 
Because sometimes if you just import an asset, it might be a thousand times larger than it needs to be, or you know, it might be tiny. And, and then when you're scaling things inside of Spark, which is probably fine, but I think it's more ideal if things just come in properly. So here in Cinema, I'm just using a, a sweep object with two splines. And with the sweep object, you can control the diameter or the, I guess, the scale along the path. And so I'm able to start it really wide at the contact point and then get it nice and slim near the bottom. Now back in Ryzen UV, I'm just chopping this up. And because it's such a long, narrow object, most of the UV space would be wasted. So instead, I chopped it almost like every other row of polygons just to maximize that UV space. And <laughs> here I'm back in Substance Painter. I don't know if this was the best way to do this, but ended up working out all right. And because these braids are so small in the scene and you know the, the object's so narrow, it, it doesn't have to be photo real. And if anything, it's just good practice to manually paint as much as you can, trying to see how realistic you can get stuff just from you know some basic brushes. And I am by no means a professional texture painter, so there's definitely better ways to do all of this. I probably could have taken one texture, one, one part of a texture, and cloned it down this, or or used a stencil or whatever, but no, it was, it was easy enough just to do all this manually. And that way you get a little bit more natural variation, because each brush stroke is going to be a little bit different. And there you go, there's the braid. And I was having an issue in Substance Painter when I removed some of the channels, it would crash kind of regularly and I would have to open it back up, kill the channels again, and then it would work. So I wasn't really able to figure out what was going on there, but a little reboot always helped. Now here I'm painting the opacity on the layer, or on the object. Because in, in Substance, each layer has its own color, opacity, height. Basically every channel that you want to export, every layer in your layer stack has all that information. But you can also turn off all that information for any layer. So I have the opacity turned off on every layer except for this top layer, which I'm manually painting, and that's where 100% of the opacity information comes from, because none of the other layers are affecting opacity at all. So here, just like with the, the high pony earlier, now we're rigging this, this braid. And I initially you know, rig the whole thing all the way down, but then I realized I'm not going to get that detailed with the rigging and the animation in Spark. Like, I don't need that many joints just to have the hair move a little bit. So in the end, I'm just rigging that little corner where the most of the animation or the, the movement will come from. And really, if you think about it, if you have a braid like that and you tilt your head the whole braid's not going to curl or move that much it's just going to you know hang down from gravity so you only needed a, a couple joints to get that across and doing hair in in AR and in Spark is really tricky if you if you want like a full head of hair you know, there's a lot of different ways to tackle it, but it's it's a lot of work and a lot of experimentation because obviously you can't have 50,000 hairs in a scene. So you have to get smart with how you use texture and how you layer up a few image planes to, to get that across. 
So for this one, I didn't do his actual hair, but just the braids. And I think, I mean, I think that'll look good on, on most heads. Even if you have a shaved head, I, I think that might be kind of funny. And so here you can see it lines up just right because I'm using that head shape in Cinema 4D. And so everything is exactly where I was hoping it would be. I think I might have had to scale it down a little bit initially when I imported it, but the ratio of everything was correct. Another trick is that in Spark, you can have a separate alpha channel in your material, but you can also have alpha in your color channel. And that way, if you have alpha in the color channel, you only have one texture or one like image texture per material. So I, th I think it might be a little bit more efficient that way. Now here I'm running into a problem where the smoke being emitted is coming out in front of the dreads or the, the braids and making them invisible because Spark doesn't, you know, it tries not to calculate too many layers of opacity if it doesn't need to. So I think what I ended up doing here is adding it to a... All right, let's see, what did I do? I think I just put it below the braids in the layer stack and then made it ignore depth. Or maybe vice versa, I have the dreads ignore. I don't know, you can pause the video and <laughs> see what I did. So now here I'm starting to strategize on the rigging of these braids. Because there's so few joints, the, the base joint won't move at all because that's that would control the whole object. And so I'm only needing to affect the one joint per braid. And so I have those four objects there. And I think because I essentially mirrored <laughs> two of the braids, I have to negate those two. So the head rotation is opposite to what the joint rotation needs to be. Because the goal here is just to have it look natural. When you move your head, they just drape down as they would in real life. And in theory, I could have also added forward and backward rotation, but I figured left and right would be enough to get some natural movement without over-engineering it. And you can see here I'm also using a maximum node and that makes it so when I tilt my head, the hair doesn't occlude the face. It stops right when it hits the face. Because otherwise it would clip through the face and it would either be visible inside of your face or just disappear in your head. And so with this, with Travis Scott, you have to open your mouth to trigger the smoke effect and in Spark, it's nice, as with you know any interactive media, to have instructions so it's clear what users are supposed to do, which turned out to be a lot of work figuring out because when the user starts the app, there's instructions to hit record to start the, the filter process. But then if Travis Scott is selected, the open mouth instruction appears. And so I had to figure out how to kind of offset those change what the instruction says and I think I get more into that later but yeah it was definitely some work getting that to work right but in the end I found a pretty simple solution for it I think I'll I'll get back to that in a minute here I'm just kind of double checking my file size making sure things are somewhat optimized as I move forward and now we're on to Ed Sheeran He's got a, a nice, simple aesthetic. He's always wearing glasses, and he has red hair, but like I was saying earlier, hair is a lot of work, and a hairstyle like that would be too much work. <laughs> but thankfully, the glasses are iconic enough that I figured that was enough. So I found a photo of him that was pretty straight on. I leveled it out in Photoshop just to make it easier in cinema just to pop that in. And then and again... I'm using that head shape to make sure the size of everything just starts out correct. 
here using two circles and a loft object, I'm able to almost like NURBS model the shape of this sunglass or this glasses frame rather than manually making those polygons and kind of doing it brute force I use these shapes to get that nice even curvature with only four points per circle and then now that I've baked that down I'm manually moving the polygons to fit the rest of the details of the glasses frame And the goal here is always to keep it as low polygon as possible while keeping those curves smooth enough. So there's a balance. You obviously don't want 100 polygons just to get around a curve, but you also want it to look good. And so you've got to find out where that medium is. And the tricky thing is photos of glasses don't show you know the perfect side profile and so I kind of had to guess how the glasses curved along the front of the face because glasses definitely have a bit of curvature they're not usually perfectly straight unless you know that's a specific style so here I'm just kind of contouring it to the face we also don't want it too close to the head object are too close to your temples because you know people have different head shapes and head sizes and you know the 3d object isn't going to automatically scale up based on your head size and that's something that I think snapchat might have a better solution for but in spark IR I don't I don't know if you can measure a head size automatically maybe with scripting so now back in Ryzen I'm chopping up the UVs, making it as efficient as possible. And you can see the texture on these glasses is very horizontal. It's kind of like a fake wood grain. So ideally, the UV would have been straight across where I could just overlay a texture right on there. But I didn't think about that until it was way too late. <laughs> so I ended up just kind of manually painting it first. That was not working at all. And so I think here in a second, I pop in a wood texture and yeah, there we go. And then using triplanar projection, it just automatically blends all three axes together. And so that way there's no seams, no visible edges where the things blend together. And as you can see in the example image of him on the right, there's some highlights in the center of the frame and along the edges as if it's beveled. But again, because I want to keep the polygon count down, I'm just manually painting in some of those highlights. And as long as you keep it subtle enough, it, it looks realistic from a distance. And it keeps that polygon count down. There it is again. <laughs> Killing those, those layers or those different channels made it crash, but rebooting is fine. So here again, I'm painting the opacity of the back edge of the frames because ear tracking is definitely not a thing. And so in pretty much any filter you see with glasses, the glasses will either just stop or they'll fade out to nothing as they approach the ear. Things are looking good. I'm exporting this out of cinema and back into Spark. And if I'm exporting just an object, I usually use FPX. It seems to be a smaller file size. And, and I don't know if Spark interprets 3D objects itself or if it just uses it as an FBX. So maybe it doesn't matter once it's in the Spark platform. But I know it's always good to start with a small file size if you can. And one nice thing about Spark is that if you change the underlying color, even when you're using a texture, it will kind of add some of that color into your into your texture. And so you can kind of 
adjusts the color after you already make the texture, which is nice. Because sometimes if you're using like a physically based material, it's going to get a little lighter or it might become a little washed out because it's reflecting an environment. So now I have the glasses in there, but they look very fake, very digital because there's there's no shadows being cast on my face. And of course, shadow casting in Spark is definitely not a thing, at least as far as I know. And so instead I'm manually painting where I I hope to be, to be the shadows on a face according to the, you know, where the face mesh is UV'd. And I got pretty close here. Thankfully, you can just easily scoot things around. But once I get things lined up, you'll notice that the glasses feel a lot more believable because they are actually re reacting to your face and not just plastered on your face completely digitally. I mean, it is, but you know what I mean. Here I'm noticing the shadows around the eyebrows are way too dark. Definitely don't need those at all, actually. So I painted those out, moved the shadow on the bridge of the nose up a little bit. And now we're starting to look pretty good. I think I might tone it down a little bit, but just like even just having that grounding shadow on the top of the cheek makes such a difference. All right, so now I'm back on the Post Malone tattoo, kind of softening those edges and smudging up by hand those those hard edges because obviously tattoos aren't pixel based, and so if you can remove any semblance of the digital, then it's going to look a lot better. And this smudge brush, I I got it from someone online, and it is amazing. It it kind of it takes like it's not. A traditional smudge like you would imagine where it just like smears things around it it's almost like you're taking a little sponge and like dabbing it around and smushing it and so it it, it actually adds texture while smoothing things it doesn't just blur and you can see there it's looking a lot better And you can notice that the the LUTs are affecting each one differently. So the Post Malone one is black and white to kind of put more focus on the tattoos and less just on the color of the scene. Now next stop is Taylor Swift. She was tricky because her style is not any one thing. Like, she just uses her face and her voice and her kind of craft as her style. She doesn't have, like, I think she used to wear that kind of top hat looking thing or bull hat, whatever, but I don't think she does that anymore. And I wouldn't think of a hat when thinking of Taylor Swift. So in the end, at least initially, I was just going to do her classic smoky eyes and red lipstick look. Eventually, I add a microphone in, which I think sells the concept a little bit more. And thankfully, a lot of the work's already been done because I've made plenty of makeup textures, and so all these are already layered out. I can easily adjust the color using a color overlay on any filter or any layer. And here I'm taking the shape of her lips and using that as a guide to kind of cut some of the top part of the lip out. Because, yeah, you can see when I unhide her image. Her lipstick is very pointed at the top tips of the lip. Tips of the lip. The perspective is a little confusing though because the photo of her is taken slightly above the eye line and so her lip shape is a little bit more upward versus the Spark AR mesh is very horizontal. There's no perspective and there's no smiling or frowning. And so that lip shape 
has to be straight across or else it won't fit on the face properly. So you can't just take a lip shape and put it right on a face because it, it might not line up right. I'm having a little trouble here getting that shape just right. It's it's a very specific shape. It's not quite rounded. There's a little bit of a point on the top, but it's not like a sharp edge. It's like all this effort goes into these little details and people will not think twice <laughs> about it, but but that's good. They they shouldn't notice. If if they do notice, then that means something's gone wrong. It should just feel right. Now we're on to Lil Nas X, or however you say it. I have no idea. But he recently got very noticed at I think it was the Grammys when he wore this bright pink cowboy outfit with matching cowboy hat, and so obviously doing this for Spark Air was a very obvious choice. And I should make it clear that I picked these artists because they were the top artists of 2019 on the charts. I did not use any personal preference because I wanted to kind of take my own musical preference out of the loop and let this be a filter for just music lovers in general, not like an EDM person or a country person, but just like people in general. Got to make it go viral, you know? So now here I, I bought a cowboy hat on Turbo Squid, and it was the perfect shape, but way too dense in the, the polygon count. So I manually went through, deleted all the edge loops I could that weren't necessary for the overall shape. And, and yeah, so now I'm just manually modeling some of these details along the, I guess, belts of the hat. And because these are going to be very small, they can be just very simple shapes. You don't need all the intricacies that the real hat would have, but just enough to get the point across. And now I'm, I'm just now bringing the head shape in to make sure the scale of everything is correct. And when you do work with 3D objects, importing and exporting, it's good to put a null at 000 in your world and then have your 3D objects under that null. So when you import that null, it should be in the exact correct position. So now I'm trying to find a high-res image of the hat to get that emblem texture. But in the meantime, I'm unwrapping the hat. I think I think I didn't even use a textured image on the hat itself, but it's good to unwrap everything just in case I throw on a, a noise texture, it'll automatically just fit on there correctly. And I'm finding that emblem texture and I'm gonna cut it out, put it in the center, and that'll just map right onto that emblem really easily. And so here's a really awesome program. It's called Gigapixel AI. It's from Topaz Labs, and they make a handful of different programs that use AI for image editing, resizing, and noise reduction. So I took that really noise or that really low res image, piped it in there. I think I made it 400% larger, and it used it actually uses AI to find the edges and put information in that you couldn't get just by scaling it up in Photoshop. Like it actually uses some sort of magic AI to, to do that. So you can take a pretty low res image and get a usable asset out of it. And the funny thing is his hat is so vibrant and so smooth that you almost don't need a texture or like a, a bump map on it because 
I mean, I looked at the high-res images of that hat, and it is real smooth. There's a few wrinkles where there's, you know, manufacturing, you know, evidence. But, yeah, and it is if you don't need a texture in Spark, like if you can just use a standard material, you're going to save that much more file size. And the hat definitely looks digital, but I don't know, I don't, didn't really care. It's just a fun filter. It's not supposed to be photo real or, you know, too high a fidelity. So here you, you saw in Photoshop really quick, I made a gradient that I'm using to put onto a face mesh to have a grounding shadow for the hat. So that way it doesn't look like it's just floating above your head, but it's actually, you know, embedded into the scene. Like those little details make it, make it go a long way. Now we're on to, excuse me, on to Halsey. And she, she's had a few iconic makeup styles in, in her album art and I think photo shoots too, but this is a pretty recent album and a pretty, you know, fun makeup idea, kind of asymmetric design. So I just took that into Photoshop, cleaned up all the edges around it, tried to remove any of the skin tone along that edge, and I think I just paint out the eye and then use a kind of spattery brush to roughen up those edges. Because anything dealing with skin, you want it to be a a little bit noisy. If it's too perfect or too smooth or the edges are too sharp, you're definitely going to notice that. Like here, you can see those edges around the, the outside are very rough, very hard. So here I'm just manually painting a little texture in there, you're getting a little human element into it, removing the digital. And because I already have all those makeup PSDs made, I was able to grab one of those, adjust it a little bit, and then drop in the the glitter face, and glitter eye. And so for the the glitter eye, I wanted to actually be shiny and not just a color. So I'm using a physically based material on the face mesh, and I'm using that same black and white environment. So as you move your head around, the the shininess will be visible, and you'll see reflections bouncing around in there. And she's also, I mean, she has freckles on her face, and sometimes she puts makeup over it, but other times she'll be a little, you know, less concealed about it. And so I thought that'd be fun to include as well. And rather than trying to extract her exact freckles or, or freckles in general, I just got a brush and painted them on. So now I'm just kind of going through, making sure everything works. <laughs> this is really funny, sped up. I think I'm repositioning the, the image a little bit. The head was a little too low, as if you didn't have a neck. And this one's a bit silly because the Text, the texture of Drake is anchored to the head, so when you rotate, your face might kind of slip in and out, but I don't know, I thought it was kind of funny, and it's, it still works pretty well. So now on to Khalid. I did some digging on him, and he really, like, his style is just like his style. He doesn't have these big accessories or big any, anything to grab onto, but 
his hair and his facial hair, of course, are very iconic. And hair is definitely one of the harder things to do in in 3D and in Spark. So I definitely saved this one for last because I was kind of dreading it. But in the end, I think it turned out pretty well. We'll we'll see the progress here. So yeah, for the beard, rather than drawing a beard from scratch or using some sort of templated beard, I found a high-res photo of Khalid. I skewed it enough so it would fit the kind of wider shape of this face mesh, face mesh texture. And then I extracted the darker channels and painted out some of the skin that was left over just to get that base material to start working off of. And in the photo, he was almost 45 degrees to camera, but that's actually ideal because this face mesh, it wraps around to the side of the face, so you, you actually almost want it to be a slight like 30 to 40 degrees, you know, photographic reference to, to pull from. Here I just mirrored it and painted out some of the artifacts that came from the mirroring. Then I noticed there's a lot of brown that I, I didn't notice in the opa or opaque mode, but put in that white background, it made that skin tone show through the, the hair on the edges there. So right away it looks fine, but it's super, like obviously along the face there's no growth. And Khalid's beard is fairly fluffy, there's, there's some good shape to it. <laughs> and so... I made, I think I might have forgotten to record this, uh, screen record it, but I made this kind of beard ball based on the edges of his beard. And, oh yeah, there, there it is. Um, so this I was able to use to kind of place billboards, which are, you know, just like flat images within the beard to add some edge detail and give it a little bit more volume and growth. And assuming people are going to be facing the camera, I wasn't too worried about people seeing the, the way it's built by turning their head too much. And if they do, I mean, that's fine. It's, it's not a secret. And as long as you layer up enough of these, it looks pretty decent from side to side. And because all of these beard fluff shapes are anchored to the chin as you open your mouth, I mean, it doesn't really stretch, but it's it's locked to the chin, so it does kind of move somewhat organically. Now I'm on to his high top fade. <laughs> modeling this was very easy at first, just the modeling part of it, not the texturing, but because it's such a perfectly cylindrical shape, I was able just to make a cylinder around the edges add a little bit of displacement to give some irregularity. And then here I'm placing planes where I hope to place those kind of beard ball shapes, you know, those those planes of hair that add those edge details. Because otherwise the edge of the hair would be perfectly smooth and flat and not look realistic at all. And in this process I'm trying to figure out what what will look natural, what will look good, and what will actually function. It's like if, if the planes are rotated randomly, then it might be a little too weird, or like they might be facing camera, and so you'd see the edge, like the flat edge of these image planes. And so I kind of used a couple effectors in cinema to pivot the the left and right halves kind of back a little bit. So if you rotate your head, Hopefully you don't rotate enough where you do see the edge of those planes. And now kind of similar to the beard ball that I made earlier, I took a chunk of his hair, isolated that out, and by roughening the edges I could just duplicate this out and make a seamless hair texture that I'll use on that hair shape. And with the um, spot removal tool, 
it can use it uses content aware filling and so it uses you know information in the image to fill in anything you want to paint out so you can quickly reduce the the pops of highlights or the repetitive shapes in there so now you can see with that kind of round oh so this is the beard balls again but i'm repurposing that for the hair because his beard and his hair are very very similar in texture and color and you know these are you're just going to see the edge of, the, of these so it doesn't have to be exactly his hair so now you can kind of see where this is going you get a little bit of that extra detail without having to manually model all those pieces of hair and of course dealing with opaque or transparent textures in spark is a little tricky because it doesn't it doesn't do like ray tracing and so you have to get smart with how you layer up things in the scene hierarchy and in the actual scene itself so here i'm i'm noticing that where the hair hits the face there's a very hard edge because one the hair has a hard edge and two the, obviously the face has a hard edge and you excuse me and you can soften the the face mesh using an alpha but i didn't want to do that and you know interfere with the other filter or other parts of this filter so instead i opened this in substance painter and i'm just manually painting the opacity of this bottom edge so that it'll fade into your head rather than just cutting off And again, I'm using triplanar projection to take that hair texture and just apply it to the whole thing. So that way, the, the like density of the hair will be the same on the whole texture. So there shouldn't be any stretching or pulling on the, the UVs. Okay, I'm just doing a little bit of cleanup, deleting assets that aren't used anymore. So it's starting to look pretty good. I'm noticing if I look up, I can see some of the hair image planes showing through. So I'm moving some of those up and out of the way. Oh yeah, and here I'm trying to find where that hard edge is coming from because it's not not super clear what's doing that. I'm, I'm hiding different shapes and it's still, you can still see that edge on the top of my head. Eventually I figure out it's actually the beard texture on the face mesh, which is, you know, it's not, there's no uh, visibility or opacity at the forehead, but because it's still calculating, I ended up using the use alpha test. And so it cut that object out around the alpha. So here I'm just, I made a little screen tap counter that you can see on the left there. So I can manually toggle through all the different effects just to test it out rather than inputting the number manually or relying on the random thing to, to help me test it. Just doing some more cleanup. In the asset summary tab, it's, it's really nice because it shows you what assets are being used. But I found that sometimes if you are if you have a texture in the node editor and you, you're piping it into something, it doesn't always recognize that as being used even though it's being piped into something. So just be careful before you start deleting everything in there. 
So here, to further optimize, I'm using tinyping.com, which is a really awesome online PNG optimizer. What it does is it, it takes your ping, it reduces the number of color channels as much as possible. So you, you still have a high fidelity image, but you don't need you know, 20,000 colors in it if, if you don't need to. And so because of that, you can reduce the file size by between like 30 and 80%, depending on you know, the kind of image. And Spark does have its own image optimization in it, but sometimes you can do better outside of Spark, or I find that often it'll get hung up and it, it'll either take like 20 minutes to optimize one image or it just freezes up and just won't continue the compression. I'm not really sure if I'm doing something wrong or maybe it's a video card issue, but it's just nice to be able to optimize before you bring it into Spark because that way you know it's already a pretty optimized image. The one thing though you do not want to optimize are the LUTs because the LUT has color information in every pixel that's very important. So you don't want to optimize and you want to make sure no compression is turned on in Spark. Otherwise you'll get some weird artifacting with the color. Like a lot of times the shadows will start turning red or things will just look a little glitchy. So here I'm, I am using the Spark compression and like sometimes it'll work well, sometimes it won't. Um, another thing to look out for is if you if you're compressing something with opacity, like an alpha channel, it'll often kind of bug that out a little bit. Like the opacity channel won't be lined up right, or it'll be more rough than it than it should be. So when you do that, make sure you test the the visual fidelity of everything before submitting it, because it can make it a little muddier. So now I'm getting into some of the title design. I, I did a lot of that without screen recording because I was just browsing fonts for most of it and I didn't think that was necessary to show. But I ended up finding one font that I really liked that was kind of playful, almost like a comic book font, but it was a happy medium between silly and serious and I don't know, it just looks fun. You'll see it here in a second. Yeah, there we go. The, the top half is that font I'm talking about. The bottom is just an, a nice little script I found. And I'm sure I'll, I'll open it at some point in this screen recording, but um, FontBase is this really awesome font manager. It's probably for Mac and Windows. I'm on Windows here, and it's working. But what it does is it, it manages your fonts, so you can import fonts into this program, but you don't activate the fonts unless you want them. So that way when you open up Photoshop, Photoshop's not loading 50,000 fonts, it's only loading the default system fonts and then any fonts you have activated. So that way if you, you're working on a project, you install 50 fonts, you can disable those later and your system still runs pretty well. Now here I'm building out the logic for how this title interacts. So already I have it tied to the position of the head and there's a little bit of a delay, and I was able to do that because the title is not parented underneath the face tracker, but next to it. So I'm using the position of the face tracker with an exponential smoothing piped into that title, and that gives it the tracking with a little bit of delay. And yeah, for all of this, just feel free to pause and look at the nodes. I'm not, I'm not getting so granular that I'm going to explain every single node but hopefully you can dive in and at least understand the logic that's going on. And if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the either the Vimeo video or, I don't know, wherever you can find me. I'm not going to mentor you, but I can a answer a couple questions about my process. And I'm popping onto Turbo Squid looking for a nice microphone model. I think I might have gotten distracted and shelved that for a little while. And 
after getting a little bit of feedback on the filter, one note was that the Billie Eilish makeup was a little too zombified, a little too messy. And, and I think her more iconic look is like this other reference image here that's just a few streaks of the black tears rather than <clears throat> the like full-on messy kind of gross face. So I'm just starting from scratch using a, a smoother brush, having a little bit stronger of a concept in mind. And this time around I'm adding just a slight bevel just to get a little bit of depth in there. And I'm still going to make this reflective inside of Spark, but adding that bevel just gives it a little extra depth. And here's that amazing smudge brush again, just softening up those edges, giving it giving it a look that maybe you've you've touched it a little bit or it's, you know, bled into the skin. And it's so easy to go overboard with this stuff, but sometimes just like a few little touches is all you need. And, and there you can see that the paint dripping looks a lot better than it did before. A lot cleaner, a lot more iconic. Just like some of the principles of, of character design, like you want to focus on a really clean, solid uh, silhouette rather than, you know, mudding up everything on the inside. Like that silhouette needs to be really sharp. Now I'm going and making all the titles for each of the artists. So there's a lot of different ways I could have done this. I ended up making one image plane per person, per artist. Another technique would be to make one plane and then have this, have all these textures be an image sequence. And that way I could play the sequence depending on who was being shown. Um, I decided to do individual image planes just so I could put that within the null. Or actually, I I didn't keep it in each artist's null because I want it to be more floaty. But it was just easy enough. I have all the logic already built for visibility for the the like face nulls, so I can just do the same for the the objects themselves, the title objects. So here you can see the. The tracking's working, it's following above and below the face for the title and the artist name. So here I it's definitely struggling. You can see me creating and deleting some nodes. I'm I'm trying to make the logic where when you start the filter, you see the title, but you don't see any names. And then when you start the randomization, you do see the names. And then eventually when it stops, you just see that, you know, the, the result. So here I'm testing the functionality of the randomization. I also want that title to be visible when the randomization starts, but then have it disappear when the filter is finished, because you don't want to see that intro title the whole time. So for the visibility of each of the artist name objects, I'm just putting that right next to the null visibility in that node structure there, the, the yellow pieces there in the center. Because I already have all this logic built out, so I can just pipe that node right into the next one. And if you guys see anything that I'm doing that you know of that's very inefficient or if there's better ways to do it, I'd love to know because you know, I'm, I think we're all just kind of figuring this out as we go, and there's definitely better ways to do almost anything when you're dealing with nodes and logic and hierarchies like this. One thing that's really nice is just keeping organized with all those comment groups, because that way, 
you know, you know where the edges of that kind of section of logic is built out. And if you zoom in, you can see the names of what is inside of each of those. And so you can quickly find what you're looking for when it gets this big, this, this many nodes. And here I'm, I'm fixing a little issue with Khalid's hair. I've, if you look upwards, you could see through kind of the gap between the forehead and the hair and see some of those hair shapes poking through. And so I just moved that forward so they're only on the front edge of the hair and so you don't see them kind of through the back of the hair. And now this is where I <laughs> really struggled. So the goal, so I, I have an open mouth instruction that I want to show for Travis Scott because he has the smoke coming out of his mouth. And so I want that to show up after Travis Scott is selected, but not before. And with the instructions, you don't have different instruction objects as far as I know, but you can, you can have a node pipe in what the current instruction is. And so, uh, yeah, it was a bit of a headache, but in the end I have a timer. So once the, the thing gets started, once the effect gets started, there's a five second delay, and if that that time is like over five seconds, I think I I have I compare that, and Travis Scott is selected, then it will trigger the open your mouth instruction. Here I'm just adjusting the Halsey glitter makeup. It's definitely too opaque, and it looked a little artificial, especially when I tested it on a phone, and so I'm adjusting the opacity in Spark, and then I'm back in Photoshop, kind of roughening those edges a little bit more, and even chopping a little bit deeper into it and pulling out some of the chunks in the center just to add a little bit more imperfection so it's not such a solid, flat shape. And the difference is subtle, but I think it adds a little bit more realism. I'm just deleting some extra files that were stuck in that asset library. And then here, the the face hole, as you can see there, is completely messed up. It, that, that's a tricky thing, because normally if you have holes in the eyes and the, the mouth, you see the actual background texture. But if you have something different in your scene, like if you have a, a flat color background or a texture background, you can't punch out the eyes and the mouth because you would see like that yellow background. So for the Drake face mesh, I had to include the eyes and the mouth where usually I would have those as holes. And here there's an issue where if you looked up, you would see the back of the cowboy hat showing through your neck. And so I just doubled the head occl occluder and block it that way. So now, here comes the fun part. Um, I realized this was a really fun opportunity to use this 3D scan that I made some time ago. And the story, I, how I got this is pretty funny. I, I made a photo scan, my wife took a bunch of photos of me and I used either 3D Zephyr or the uh, photo, I think photo scan is what it's called. Either way, I used a program, a photogrammetry program and made a 3D model of my face and my you know upper body and I uploaded that to Sketchfab. And then I think like two or three years ago, I was on Sketchfab and I saw a model that looked a lot like me. And then it turned out some 3D artist had downloaded my photo scan, retopologized it, optimized it, retextured it completely, added hair, stubble, eyeballs, like everything, like practically a triple A level um, model. And this person didn't have it for sale on Sketchfab, but I, I got in hold of him and bought it off of them. And so now I have this really high quality 3D scan or, you know, 3D optimized model of my head. And so I decided to put that in this filter as well. And this would be the only full 3D person in the whole filter, which I thought was kind of fun. 
And, you know, because it's a full 3D bust, including a shirt and eyes, and I think eventually I just delete the eyelashes, but because it's pretty high fidelity, I had to heavily polygon reduce things to get it into a manageable file size. I think in the end I got it down to 340 kilobytes, not including textures, which is pretty small, but still you only have 4 megs to work with, and so, you know, ideally it would be a little bit smaller than that, but because I was being very efficient so far, I had a little bit of headroom still. Headroom. <laughs> nice. And so here, this is a bad idea, but I used a volume mesher to convert all those hair, like those little hair planes that the artist had put in there into one solid shape just to reduce the amount of polygons. And this is just a temporary texture on it now, but it turned out to be way too blobby and still not very efficient. So eventually I just remodel it by hand and it looked a lot better that way. And here, just to further increase efficiency or reduce the file size, I'm deleting any polygon I think won't be visible after already reducing the object a lot. And then here I noticed the entire inside of the mouth is fully modeled. And because I'm not rigging the entire face, I'm not going to do blend shapes or anything crazy because I just I don't have that much energy. Um, so I was able to delete everything inside the face, even the back of the eyeballs I was able to cut out of there. And there are a few places where the mesh got a little janky, so I just went in, softened some of those edges, added a few edges. So yeah, here I'm deleting the back sides of those eyeballs and the back of the neck. And I'm sure there's another, you know, couple hundred polygons I probably could have gone in and deleted, but as long as you get a good chunk out, I, I think, you know, just do your best. I'm so glad I didn't end up using that hair chunk. <laughs> ended up kind of kind of looking gnarly. So now, similar to how I rigged the hair earlier, I'm going to be rigging my, I guess, chest and neck. And because I want the, the chest shape to be static and the head to move, but the, the, the way it works is kind of backwards because I'm anchoring the head to the user's head, and so the joint chain starts at the head and goes down to the body. So if you rotate the head, like your own head, 10 degrees, then the torso will rotate counter to that. And so it ends up, it's almost like reverse, not reverse kinematics really, but just like it's counter animating opposite to what you're doing. To, I don't know, it'll, it'll make sense once we get into Spark. But basically, using the head rotation to counter rotate the body. I think this is sim similar to how you rig like a bow tie or a neck thing. Because Spark doesn't track your neck or your body, but it can track, you know, the rotation of your head, I guess relative to the camera. And so with that information, you can use that for the rig. I'm finally get an inside of Spark. So see, you can see here that, you know, as my head is rotated, the body goes, you know, out to the side. And so I'm using, I think, the opposite rotation to control that joint. And at first I just do left and right. But then I realize I can do all three axes, and it, in theory, should track your head movement pretty well. So here, I think all three are piped in, and you can see it's pretty accurate. I mean, obviously my torso is moving around a lot more than it normally would, but but you, you still get a lot of a lot of proper neck deformation. That's honestly surprised me when it started working.
here I'm reducing the file size just kind of these were pings and I'm converting them to JPEGs because I'm not using any transparency in this so I don't need any of the ping information that might be in there And here I'm using a standard material, but because the <clears throat> the object is so low res, you see a lot of the artifacts. And so, yeah, I ended up just using a flat material because I, I know it's not super realistic. It looks like I'm in some overcast environment, which maybe that's fine. But I don't know I think because the texture is so high quality of my face, then the you know the flat material works fine. And again, this is this is an augmented reality filter. This is like a movie, so it doesn't have to be photoreal. If anything, this is probably one of the more photoreal things that's happened inside of Spark. So here I'm just using the pen tool in Cinema 4D and manually retopologizing the hairs as light as I could. Definitely didn't need near the amount of polygons I was using before. Because really it's just going to be a texture mapped kind of on top of my head with a little bit of space to, to give the hair a little bit of volume. And no, I'm not Jewish, if you're wondering. <laughs> so you can see I opened up Ryzen UV and UV unwrapped that in like two seconds. <laughs> it's so awesome. And then using the Substance Painter Live Link in Cinema 4D, I was able to automatically send over that mesh into Substance, paint on it, and then I'll be able to get those textures out really quick. Yeah, hair can be really tricky, but if you just have a very basic shape and you paint in the highlights of the hair and don't get too granular, your imagination kind of fills in the blank and you understand that that's close enough. It doesn't have to be picture perfect. You, you don't expect to see a lot of depth or dimension in a hair object in 3D, especially in something real time like this. And now that I have the color information, I'm going in and painting all the opacity. Because obviously if that bottom edge is completely opaque, it's going to look very sharp, very artificial. So painting in the opacity manually, similar to the shape of the hair, it'll make it blend in much more naturally. It's definitely a bit of manual labor, but I know I kind of like hand painting things. It it makes things feel more natural because it's so easy to do everything completely digitally, and then you're just left with this very I don't know fake feeling thing. And the the edge of the UVs I kind of blast out these textures just to prevent the edge from being the wrong color. But because I'm using this just on a flat shape and I don't want more color information bleeding out. I just painted that out because I figured that would maybe reduce the file size a teeny bit. Here I'm just vibrating with excitement. <laughs> The funny thing working on these filters is that you're just staring at your face all day. And yeah, they, they do have example videos of other people, but so often you want to 
test you know the limits and do specific things and so using a, a little webcam to test is very helpful but very strange and of course I wanted to give myself a little shameless plug in the filter and so I'm putting my Instagram handle in there Now I found a microphone asset and I'm completely brutalizing the polygon count. It was way too high of resolution. Nobody needs that many polygons. It's definitely laborious. In the end, I could have modeled this from scratch in half the time, but I thought it'd be nice to include some of those details. And eventually I deleted the the little switch on the side and everything because I, I realized like no one's going to care about that level of detail they just they just want to have fun with the filter and sometimes optimizing meshes can be kind of pleasant you're just mindlessly deleting and cleaning up and and then when you get this minimum amount of polygons it just feels so good it's so, just so efficient and i'm very ocd and so maybe that maybe that's why and I have this make quad thing that up in the top right. You can see that little orange circle on top of that cylinder. So that's supposed to make a quad and a hole in a polygon, and it was not working, so I just manually closed that hole. And here I am in Ryzen UV again, chopping this guy up. And because I wasn't going to do too much in the texture, I didn't have to make all those shapes straight. Normally, if you have something unwrapped and you get that kind of C-shape or that curled UV island, you would want that to be perfectly straight. Like here, you can see they're all a little curved. But because I'm not doing any text or anything in there, I don't have to worry about getting those straight. It was only the mesh part right here that I was worried about getting somewhat accurate and because actually I, I tried triplanar projection at first, but just using the UVs were a little bit better because there was no, no seams at all, no edges. And I guess there's one seam along the back of the cylindrical part, but whatever. And here I'm, I'm in Cinema 4D placing the microphone before I even go into Spark because I know if I put a parent null at 000, that microphone should import in the right location. And like moving stuff around in Spark isn't the worst thing, but I know it's kind of nice just to import assets and have them be zeroed out rather than moving them all over the place. And that way you, you could also rig that parent null and then reposition the object within it regardless of the parent null. So if you just need to tweak it, you don't have to tweak a bunch of nodes, but you can just move it kind of like what I'm doing there maybe. So the goal with this microphone was to make it track the face. And at first I just put it in the same null as the titles, which was technically working, but it appears completely locked to the Taylor Swift title. And I mean, that's kind of fine, but it looks, it makes the microphone look really fake. So eventually I'm gonna break that out. Oh yeah, here we go. So now that I broke that out, I'm tying the rotation and location of the mic to the face with a delay. Here I just did a bit of testing on my phone and noticed a few issues that could be slightly massaged. Just like the positions of some objects were either clipping or you could see the edge of 
you know, the, the high ponytail and just lowering it a little bit would help. Here, Taylor Swift's makeup was coming out a little dark, and so I brightened up those lips. And uh, Khalid's beard was showing through. If you opened your mouth, you could see the beard inside of your mouth. It was pretty harrowing. And so I dropped in a head occluder and just put that, scaled it down a little bit and put it right inside the head so you wouldn't see the, the rest of the beard. So here I'm finally building a explosion effect for when the randomization is finished and you get selected to be you know, one of these artists. And the the secret or the trick with this is you don't want to key or you don't want to toggle the opacity of these, but rather the birth rate. Because if you toggle the opacity, the particles will appear, but they'll already have been emitted and so they'll be, you know, halfway through their life cycle. So if you if you build a system where you kind of trigger I think I'm using a transition to go from zero to one mapped to, you know, zero to 300, then you get this kind of quick explosion that goes, you know, starts at zero. And so it looks more natural. So here you can see I'm starting to test it. The particles are going way too fast. I'm just dialing in the speed. And because everything's piped through those nodes, I can't really test in real time. I have to keep, you know, restarting the, the randomization. So now it's starting to come together. So now that I got the cloud, kind of the cloud explosion drifting up as if it's kind of a warm, dusty thing, I wanted to add a second layer of particles that are more like these heavy star sparkles or something that kind of fall off the face as the dust comes off the face. So you get this double layer of particles, which makes it a little bit more dynamic whenever you can layer up any kind of animation it always makes it feel more feel more fun here I'm, i think this is when i get real deep in optimizing cuz i know i have so much stuff in this scene and Every you know, few kilobytes helps. Like if any texture is over 100 kilobytes, you probably get it down to 30 or 40, depending. Some things like the hair, there's a lot of information, and there's an alpha channel, and so that's always going to be a little bit bigger. And all of the LUTs have to be completely uncompressed, so there's no way to get those scaled down. But thankfully those aren't too heavy. This is probably the most boring part of the process to watch, but it's definitely part of the process, and I wanted to keep all of this in the video just so you can see, you know, all the things that go on, not just the, the fun things or the things that you might learn more about. And you see I just opened iTunes. That way I can plug in my phone to my PC and send versions directly to my phone without having to go through the Instagram app. That way it doesn't have to like re-upload every version. I can just pipe it directly in. And on the iPhone, you have to have the player app, the Spark AR player. That I think it's just called player when you open it, but that's the kind of client side of the thing for this. And here I'm working on the title animation because the filter starts with an instruction and as far as I know you can't format where the instructions appear or how they appear because they're kind of pre-built into Spark I wanted the title to come in a couple seconds after you open the app that way you can read the instruction the title appears and then hopefully the user starts recording right around that moment and of course you can't control what the users do but at least there's 
a little bit of a hierarchy in terms of the time when things are appearing. And I also don't want the text to overlap because the instructions are anchored to the screen where the actual title floats in from the top and that's anchored to your face. And so depending on where your face is, it could overlap with the instructions. So offsetting the time of those was really important. And yeah, I think we're getting pretty close to the end. You can see I'm doing a lot more just optimization and testing it on my phone rather than just in the viewport because with the phone, the phone cameras are a little bit more sophisticated than this HD webcam that I have. And, you know, it uses different processors. Like I think, at least with the iPhones, there's dedicated CPUs just for some of the advanced AR kit stuff. I don't know... I don't know much about the Android AR stuff, but I don't know, maybe it's all the same. So here I was noticing in Spark AR, this wasn't an issue, but on the iPhone, if I had two face meshes in the exact same location, sometimes they would kind of clip through each other. And so my solution was for the makeup I would push the makeup 0 0.0001 forward in Z space, and that was just enough so they wouldn't intersect. But it still looks like they're completely on the face. That could have also probably been solved with hierarchy and layers, but just moving it a micrometer was easy enough, and it I think it looks great still. So here I'm looking for a background to put behind my 3D face, because currently I just had a blue background, and that was, yeah, yeah as you can see here, just god-awful. <laughs> um, and I thought it'd be fun, after looking at some stock images, I have, you know, a lot of 3D renders that I've made over the years, and at first I was going to use this landscape, and eventually I pulled up this fun kind of mystical frame I did for a, a music festival, and... It's kind of framed nicely. There's trees on the side. There's an open space in the middle. So I thought that might work well behind my face there. And getting the aspect ratio is a little confusing because you can have it fit to screen, but because it's a square image and not all devices are perfectly, you know, the same aspect ratio, I didn't want it to be stretched and so just like dialing that in and testing between the iPad and the iPhone and Android devices, I wanted to make sure none of it was squished and none of it was seeing the edge of the image. And just to make it a little moodier, here I'm adding this particle engine with these big old cloud shapes. It's the same cloud texture I'm using for Travis Scott, but with a different color cast and obviously much larger and I think even more transparent. And I wasn't loving how the shirt was looking, so I'm instead using the physically paced material for that, and that just kind of softens out some of the, the texture on it. And here I'm just testing, 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 finding little changes. And the very last thing that I saved for last, last was the audio, because I'm definitely not an audio engineer. I barely know what I'm doing in Audition. This is Adobe Audition. Um, but I knew I just wanted some sort of crescendo and like a finale, like a ta-da moment when the filter stops or, you know, selects the artist after all the, the randomization. And so I found a drum roll. I don't, I won't be including the audio in this screen recording, but a little drum roll with like a, a cymbal hit at the end and this is the first time I've used audio in Spark and it's a little confusing because you have a speaker object you have an audio playback controller you have your audio asset and I think you can even control the audio in the nodes too so there's there's a lot of things going on it, it makes sense once you dive in and start piping things together but yeah, it definitely took me a minute to figure out the flow and where things go. Here you can 
see I'm just kind of dropping in all of the different audio nodes and exploring even like what they are because you can do a lot of cool stuff like voice modulation which I'm definitely not touching on here but you know there's, there's a lot of potential for fun audio stuff which I think most artists don't really tap into when they're making filters at least so many of the filters I see getting pumped out these days and so spark AR requires I think m4a audio files which is like an mpeg compression and as far as I know you can't export that out of Adobe Media Encoder or Audition and so there's this online converter that is really quick and it'll just do it for you it'll take a, a wave file and spit out on m4a for you and you can even set the sampling rate and all that and convert it to a mono as well so it's small and and also compatible and I think that audio clip alone ended up being 500 kilobytes, which is pretty heavy f considering 4 megs is the you know, limit for Instagram. But thankfully, I've been working very efficiently, so I did have a little space to go. And <laughs> here I am in Premiere starting to edit together this very time-lapse video which I know is super meta, but I thought that was just a fun part of the, <laughs> part of the process because I you know, spent a lot of time doing all this and recording all the video. And so to kind of share that last moment, I think that was fun for you. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Um, well, that's it. You can see that this video is over and that's pretty much the whole process. I might tinker with this a little bit more, but I think you've learned as much as you can from this process. Um, I'm going to be doing this a lot more. I might not record these feature length tutorial time lapse videos every time, but I'm definitely out there and available. And if you have a project in mind or you're just starting out and just learning, you know, I'd love to collaborate or help you out or yeah, whatever I'm around. So thank you guys for watching and girls and everyone. Um, hope to catch you next time. Take care.